For several months, the nurses at Polonomai Hospital in Free State, South Africa, were baffled to find a dead patient in the same bed every Friday morning. There was no apparent cause for any of the deaths, and extensive checks on the air conditioning system and a search for possible bacterial infection failed to reveal any clues. Obviously, something was terribly wrong. However, further inquiries revealed the cause of the deaths. It seemed that every Friday morning, a cleaner would enter the ward, remove the plug that powered the patient's life support system, plug her floor polisher into the vacant socket, then go about her business. When she had finished her chores, she would plug the life support machine back in and leave, unaware that the patient was now dead. She could not, after all, hear the screams of the patient over the whirring of her polisher. In August 1996, a leading US denomination published that during 1995, they secured 384,000 decisions, but retained only 23,000 in fellowship. They couldn't account for 361,000 of their supposed conversions. That's a tragic 94% fall away rate. Obviously, something is terribly wrong. The life's plug of evangelism has been pulled out, yet most of the church carries on with their evangelistic work, totally oblivious to what is actually happening. The tragedy is happening simply because the church has forsaken the law of God as a means to bring the knowledge of sin, to use as a schoolmaster to bring sinners to Christ. In Romans 3, verses 1 to 2, Paul asked, What advantage has the Jew? And then he said, Much every way, chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. Paul continually used the phrase to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. In Ephesians 2, verse 17, the Scriptures say, Jesus came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were near. In the context, Paul is speaking about the Jew and the Gentile. He's writing to the Gentile Ephesians. He's saying, you were once afar off. And when he's speaking of those that were near, he's speaking of the Jew. The Jew had the law to bring the knowledge of sin. They had that great advantage. They had the mirror which they could look into to see their true state before a holy creator. Jesus is speaking to a scribe who understood the law. He said, you are not far from the kingdom of God because the law brings us as a schoolmaster to Christ. Those few thoughts by way of introduction, let's now look at Deuteronomy 4, verse 7, and look at this advantage the Jew has. For what nation is this so great who hath God as near as unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that has statutes and ordinances as righteous as all this law which I set before you this day. Only take heed to thyself, and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thine heart all the days of thy life. But teach them to thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb, when the Lord said to me, Gather me all the people together, and I'll make them hear the words or my words that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach them to their children. And you came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire out of the midst of heaven, with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. And the Lord spoke unto you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude. Only you heard a voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded to you to perform, even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. So what we're going to do today is take advantage of the great advantage that the Jew had by looking closely at ten functions of the ten commandments. Firstly, let's look at 2 Samuel 18, verse 15, if you may like to turn to it, but I'm sure you know the story. In 2 Samuel 18, verse 15, Job chaste, rebellious Absalom. And ten young men who bore Job's armor surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. Joab was rebellious, deceitful, and self-promoting. And the sinful Adamic nature is like Absalom. It's rebellious, it's deceitful, 
It is self-promoting. It's like Absalom, who turned against his father. We turn against the father in our sinful state. But the Ten Commandments come, and like the ten young men that surrounded Absalom and killed him as he hung upon a tree, so they surround the sinner and kill our old nature upon the tree of Calvary's cross. We die with Christ. Romans 7, verse 9, Paul says, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. It's interesting to see the world's answer to its dilemma. A song came out many years ago that went something like this. I won't sing it to you because it'll make tears come to your eyes for the wrong reasons. In fact, when I sing, people request that I sing on a hill far away. What we need is a great big melting pot, big enough to take the world and all it's got, keep it stirring for a hundred years or more, and bring out coffee-colored people by the score. That would seem to be the answer to one of the world's great problems, the racial problem. You see, the problem isn't with the skin. The problem is with sin. You see, if I didn't like the way pigs lived, and I thought, I'm going to change a pig, and I take a pig and I clean the pig, I scrub the pig, I put deodorant under its pig pits, and I put it in a room with thick carpet, and wait for three days, they'll come back, the place will be a pigsty. If I want to change the pig, I must change its nature. And that's what the law does. It changes the nature of humanity. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away, behold, all things have become new. So the law kills that sinful Adamic nature. Secondly, it stops the mouth of justification. Jeremiah 41, verse 18. Ishmael had determined to kill a group of 80 men. But the scriptures say, But ten men were found among them that said to Ishmael, Slay us not, for we have treasure in the field of wheat, of barley, and of oil, and of honey. So he forbore and slew them not among their brethren. He didn't slay them because he saw they had worth. A very well-known preacher in the U.S. said this about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were designed to put pride and dignity in your life. Now that sounds good, but it certainly isn't scriptural. It's not what the Bible teaches. The Ten Commandments were given to do the exact opposite, to bring us to a place of humility. How can the law bring dignity to a criminal? All they do is show us that sin is exceedingly sinful that we're in desperate need of God's forgiveness. Many years ago, I was uh, in my car, and I wanted to take a, an envelope, some negatives, to a photo processing place. And I was searching for this place, and suddenly I saw it at the bottom of a one-way street, maybe about 20 feet, 30 feet, at the end of this one-way street. And I was going along, and I thought, you know, there it is across there. I've missed it. So I have to go right around the block or, and come down the one-way street unless I just nip across the bottom of the one-way street into their parking lot. And without thinking very deeply, that's exactly what I did. I just went across in their parking lot. And as I parked my car, I looked out of my eye and I saw the law parking his motorcycle. I thought, whoa, he's not interested in me. So I just grabbed the negatives and I ran up the top of these stairs. As I stood at the top, I remembered two things. Number one, I was a Christian and I shouldn't be running from the law. And number two, I had picked up the wrong envelope. <laughs> so I walked down the stairs, opened the door, and there was the law leaning against my car. He knew I'd be back. He said, could I see your license? I said, certainly. Sat in the car, got out the visor, gave him the license. He looked at it, and then he said something that shook me. He said this, have you any excuse for going the wrong way up a one-way street? I thought, man, I, I didn't realize I went the wrong way up a one-way street. I just nipped across the bottom of the one-way street. But you see, the law doesn't really concern itself with the angle of the transgression. <laughs> and in my mind, I heard three words. Guilty, guilty, guilty. So I looked at the officer and said, no excuse whatsoever. He looked down at my license and said, well, there was no traffic coming. There was no harm done. He said, and I don't think you'll do it again. 
and closed my license as I sparkled, gave it back to me, and walked off. And I said to myself, Phew. <laughs> Now that officer had within his authority the discretion to show me mercy or judgment. And what was it that determined whether he went to judgment or mercy? It was what came out of my mouth. If I'd have said, but officer, there are plenty of people worse than me. Officer, there are a lot of people who drive like hypocrites. <laughs> no doubt he would have thrown the book at me because my attempted at justification would show that I wasn't truly sorry for what I'd done. But because I said no excuse whatsoever, he could see that my mouth was stopped. I had no excuse. He could see I saw myself was guilty, that I was contrite. And so he chose to give me mercy. And God has placed within our discretion, our authority, the discretion to show a sinner mercy or judgment. How do we do that? How do we know if this is a Nicodemus or a young lawyer who stands before us? It's by what comes out of his mouth. If someone says to you, I'm not a bad person, I'm a good person, really, throw the book at them. Give them the law of God. Let them hear the thunderings of Sinai. Let them see the flashes of lightning. Let the fear of God fill their heart that they might depart from sin. But if someone's mouth is stopped and says, oh, I feel so guilty. I just don't know what to say. I've broken those commandments. Give them grace. Give them mercy. And mercy rejoices over judgment. There is a sparkle in the eye of God when someone receives mercy. So the law was given to stop the mouth of justification. And we shouldn't slay the law. We shouldn't set it aside. We shouldn't say you have no relevance in gospel proclamation. Do not slay us, for we have treasures in the field. Those who come by the hand of the schoolmaster become wheat, not tears, in the kingdom of God. Turn to 2 Kings 20, verse 8, if you would. 2 Kings 20, verse 8. Number 3. The law convinces the mind. It's a function. It brings understanding. It brings light. 2 Kings 20, verse 8, And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, What shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me? And that I may go up into the house of the Lord the third day. And Isaiah said, This sign shall they have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten degrees or go back ten degrees? And Hezekiah answered, It is a light thing for the shadow to go down ten degrees. But let the shadow return back with ten degrees. And Isaiah, the prophet, cried unto the Lord, and he brought the shadow ten degrees backward, by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. The Ten Commandments are like the dark shadow that moved ten degrees and convinced Hezekiah that the good news he heard was from God. The good news of the gospel becomes good news to those who understand the degree to which they have sinned against God. Consider the fly. A clean machine is the fly. What does the fly do the first thing it lands? Why, it cleans itself. You study the fly. What does it do? Why, it cleans its front legs. It cleans its back legs. It cleans its wings. It cleans its eye. A clean machine is the fly. But study the little beast and find out what his appetites are really for. And look at man. He's a clean machine, man. Always cleaning himself. Soap, toothpaste, shampoo, deodorants. But follow the little beast and find out what his appetites are really like. Visit your video store and look at the type of entertainment he feeds upon. And yet, despite our sinful nature, which is so obvious, every man proclaims his own goodness. I live in the city of Bellflower in Southern California. It's about 15 minutes north of Disneyland. And I've noticed on a fine day and I can see every other city in that metropolitan, that hundred cities stacked together in Southern California, has a smog problem. I can see it. I look around, the horizon 360 degrees, and every single city except ours has a smog problem. But it's interesting, when I visit another city, I notice that that city is also clean. Wherever I go, it seems to be clean. All around the horizon, every other city has a smog problem. But if I get up and look at the situation from the heavens, if I'm in a plane and I look down, 
I can see that every single city is breathing in a black poison called smog. But when you're in it, you can't see it clearly. And when humanity looks itself, every man will proclaim his own goodness. He's not convinced of a sinful state. What we must do is look at it from God's point of view. The Lord looked down from heaven among the children of men to see if there were any good, and there was none good. No, not one. And we can't convince a man or a woman of their sinful state before a holy God until we use that law and press it against the conscience. When I first came to the U.S., I was preaching open air in Venice Beach, Southern California, a very famous tourist spot. We did a, a fake funeral. What we do is just get six poor bearers, young guys wearing black pants, black shoes, white shirts and black ties and sunglasses. Stand them together, a little arc, and then in front of them we would get someone to lie down and play a corpse, a Lazarus, for about 20 minutes. We'd just put a sheet over them. They'd just lie very still. Dead easy job. But always bring a quick crowd. Nothing attracts a crowd like a funeral. And I just stand up on a soapbox and preach to them and tell them they were all part of the ultimate statistic. Ten out of ten die. <laughs> I ask them what the number one killer is in the U.S. They say, what is the number one killer? And the crowd will call back cancer, AIDS, heart disease. They say, no, 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 time's up. And then I tell them what the number one killer is in the U.S. The number one killer in the United States is death. <laughs> and I say to them, why don't you wait and listen just for a few moments? Because if it's true that Jesus Christ has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, you owe it to your good sense just to listen. And a crowd gathered, maybe 80 people, very quickly. As I was about to open up the commandments and show why we die, the soul that sins it shall die, suddenly this man on a bike, wearing shorts, not the bike wearing shorts, the man was wearing shorts, he came right in front of me while I was preaching to the crowd, and he said, stop. Now, now he's looking up at me because I was on a soapbox. He said, stop now. I took no notice. I was preaching the everlasting gospel of salvation, the words of everlasting life. Who did this guy think he was? So I just kept, I totally ignored him. He said, stop now. And I thought, who does this guy think he is? He's acting like an officer of the law. And as I glanced down, I heard him say, stop now or I will arrest you. And I saw that he was wearing a badge on his belt that showed that he was an officer of the law. I stopped. Now, now notice I had no regard for him until I saw his badge of authority. His words were totally irrelevant until I understand that this man had the power of the law behind his words. Now, the world will never listen to the church as long as we keep saying it's wrong to commit adultery, it's wrong to kill children. They'll take no regard until we point to the law as our badge of authority. Jesus continually did it. He said, I have not come to do away with the law. Not one jot and a tittle of the law shall fail. This is the law and the prophets. Have you not read in the law? It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. You see, I keep hearing Christian leaders say things like, the problem with America is we have forsaken the Judeo-Christian ethic. I say, well, what are we talking about? Let's be specific. The Jude well, it is the, the moral standard that both the Jew and the Christian share. Well, what is that standard? Let's name it. It is the Ten Commandments. It is the law of God. And what we must do when we say it is wrong to commit adultery is say, it is written in God's law, the Ten Commandments, that God has put upon the tables of your own conscience. You shall not commit adultery, and God has appointed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness. Because law without consequence is nothing but good advice. That's all it is. You shall not kill. Yeah, that's a good idea. You shall not steal. You see, it makes a society run better when the law is kept. But if we don't say that God has appointed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness, the law, the law will not, the, the world will not forsake its sin. It was only my knowledge that there would be future punishment if I did not stop that caused me to stop what I was doing. And it's only when the world understands that God has appointed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness by the holy standard of the righteous law 
that they'll forsake their sins and flee from the wrath that's to come. So the law convinces the mind that we have sinned against God. Look at Leviticus 26, 26. The law does seem like a good idea. It promises satisfaction in a sense, but it doesn't deliver. This is what it says in Leviticus 26, 26. And when I've broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you the bread again by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. Think of Pilgrim's progress. Christian found himself going up the hill of that law, seeking justification by the law. It seemed a right way, but it became a way that didn't satisfy. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said. If I just describe the law for a moment, you will very readily see that you can never hope by any means to fully understand it. The law of God, as we read it in the Ten Commandments, seems very simple, very easy. When we come, however, to put even its naked precepts into practice, we find that it is quite impossible for us to fully keep them. The commandments, if I may speak, are like stars. When seen with the naked eye, they appear to be brilliant points. If we draw near to them, we should see them to be infinite worlds, greater than even our sun, stupendous though it is. So it is with the law of God. It seems to be but a luminous point, because we see it at a distance. But when we come nearer where Christ stood and estimate the law as he saw it, then we find it as vast and measurable. The commandment is exceedingly broad. What the commandment's function is, is to show us God's character. What the gospel's function is, is to bring us forgiveness, to bring us harmony, to bring us peace with God. My wife and myself were once watching a lady sit a, at a table in a restaurant. She got delivered a, a, a big meal with gravy, potatoes, meat, vegetables. And on the table in front of her was one of those sugar containers that you can tip it up. And what it does is release a certain amount of sugar into your coffee or your tea. She picked it up thinking it was salt. And she just went, shh. No doubt she didn't enjoy that meal. Because sugar has a function and salt has a function. Salt creates a thirst. Sugar satisfies. The law creates a thirst. It makes us hunger and thirst for righteousness. And the gospel brings satisfaction. So the law promises a satisfaction, but it doesn't deliver. It can't deliver. All it does is create a desire. It's the gospel that brings that satisfaction in Christ. It satisfies the demands of eternal justice. Turn to Ruth 4, verse 2. Ruth, chapter 4, verse 2. We'll go back to verse 1. Then Boaz came up to the gate and sat down, and behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spoke came by, and to whom he said, Ho, such an one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. The Ten Commandments are like ten impartial witnesses. And Boaz wanted impartial witnesses. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. And they sat down. In verse 9, And Boaz said to the elders, Now to all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's of the hand of Naomi. The Ten Commandments of the law are like the ten men who witnessed the redemption of Ruth by Boaz. The commandments stand as an indictment against the sinner until he's safely in the arms of the Redeemer. We have an 800 number that has continued being called by men who are farmers. And this is because our 800 number is 437-1893. Farmers who are somewhat dyslexic transpose the last two numbers. And we know they're farmers because they keep calling us and saying, I want to buy a fence. And so we say, sir, uh, you have transposed the last two digits on the end of the number. You meant to call 437-1839, but you called 1893. 
We had a call just recently. Another farmer called us up. He said, oh, I'd like to buy a fence. Deep voices, farmers. I said, sir, you've transposed the last two digits. He said, oh, sorry about that. I said, uh, before you go. He says, what? I said, make sure you read your Bible. He said, what? I'm an atheist. I said, sir, there's no such thing. Can you think of anything you own that wasn't made? Think of your belt, your shoes, your socks, your fence, your house, your car. Everything made has a maker. And for two minutes, I reasoned with him about the fact that if there's a creation, there must be a creator. Nothing is made without a maker. And then I said, do you think you've kept the Ten Commandments? He said, yes, very authoritatively. I said, have you ever told a lie? He said, oh, yeah. I says, what does that make you? He says, human. <laughs> he says, come on, come on. He says, well, I tell fibs. I said, that makes me weak like everybody else. And I says, come on, be honest. I said, if you tell a lie, what does it make you? He says, okay, I'm a liar. And so I reasoned with him <laughs> about stealing. I said, have you ever stolen something? And finally, he was able to admit that he had stolen. And then he said to me, but I'm a good person. I said, no, you're not. You're a lying thief. <laughs> you know how he responded to that? He said, so long, pal, and hung up in my ear. And I sat by the phone and I thought, boy, Lord, I just wished I'd had a couple more minutes to reason with that man, to talk about some other different things. Suddenly, about 15 seconds later, I heard the phone ring. I picked it up, and I, as is Living Waters Publications, he says, what's going on? How did I get you again? I try to call this number, and instead I get one that makes my blood boil. So I can only think of two reasons or two alternatives to that question. Why did he call this number again? Number one, he was stupid. <laughs> or number two, God's hand was upon him. So I said, sir, it seems that God, God's hand is upon you. And he, I guess, thought of the other alternative and agreed with me. <laughs> <laughs> you say, I can never be bold with someone like that. Yes, you could. Because the work of the law is written in their hearts. Romans 2 verse 15. I don't tell people they're lying thieves. They just admit it. I just draw out of them. Have you ever told a lie? Yes. What does it make you? A liar. And I can be bold with him because the work of the law is written on his heart. I have never, ever heard anyone say to me, but I always thought it was right to lie. I really, truly believed it was the right thing to do to steal. No, God has given light to every man. We know right from wrong. And the law stands there as an impartial witness to accuse us of our guilt, by, both by the spoken word and the conscience. Number six, the law shuts up the sinner. In Genesis 37, 23 to 24, I'm sure you're very familiar with the story, Joseph's ten half-brothers dropped him into a pit. They stripped him of his tunic and dropped him into a pit. Now, in that pit, the Bible tells us that it was a place without hope. It says, and the pit was empty and there was no water in it. And when the Ten Commandments come to us, they drop us into a pit of despair and there is no water in it in the pit. The commandments cannot deliver anything but just show us that we've sinned against God. And we don't know what happened in that pit, but that may have been the shaping of the character of Joseph. What a wonderful, godly man. Maybe in that pit that Joseph cried out to God and yielded his whole heart unto the Lord, and God delivered him in his time. The law strips us of our tunic. It strips us of our self-righteousness. It leaves us hopeless. We also get other wrong numbers, not always from farmers. I picked up the phone some time ago, and a man said such and such. I said, no, no, I'm sorry, you've called the wrong number. He said, okay, sorry about that. I said, hang on. Make sure you read your Bible. He said, why should I do that? I said, to secure your eternal destiny. And then this man said, ay, 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 I better sit down for this one. I said, are you Jewish? It was the ay, 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 ay that gave me the clue. <laughs> He said, yeah, yeah, I am. I said, well, so am I. See, my mother's Jewish, so to the Jew, I can become a Jew. And so I said, have you kept the law of Moses? Have you kept the Ten Commandments? And this is what he said. He said, I've done some research, particularly on the adultery one, and I've come to the conclusion 
that you can fool around with a woman as long as she's not married. I said, if you in lust after a woman, you commit adultery with her in your heart. If you tell one lie, you're a liar. If you steal one thing, you're a thief. And I reasoned with him, because that's what the law does. It reasons with a man. It shows him that judgment is reasonable. He can't understand hell and God's justice until he understands that he has sinned against heaven, that he's violated God's law. What would you think of an officer of the law who burst into your home, just grabbed you and threw you into prison without a word of explanation? You'd be angry. You'd be frustrated. But if an officer came in and says, there's 400 marijuana plants growing in your backyard, you say, oh, 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 I can understand why you're throwing me in prison. He has read the law to you. He has showed you your transgression. And that's what we must do when we witness to sinners. We just don't say, hey, you're going to hell. Oh, that's unreasonable. It won't make sense. It'll make him angry. What you've got to do is say, hey, you've violated God's law. This is why you're being thrown into prison. That young man said, thank you for talking with me. I mean, he was sincere. He was depressed, but he was sincere because they can understand for the first time that sin and judgment is reasonable in the light of God's law. A young lady came up to me about three or four weeks ago. I was in the city of Wellington in New Zealand. I'd just taught the night before on the law. She was a professing Christian. As I stood there, she came up to me, and I don't, I'll try and portray to you what she said to me. This is what she said. Uh, the law, phew, uh, wow. I thought, what? I said, sorry, what was that? She says, oh, the law. I thought, what? You see, God's law will only make you say, if you're guilty. I remember once I was preaching to a pile of sinners open air and a guy called out, you're laying a guilt trip on us. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. I said, well, which commandment makes you feel guilty? You shall not covet? He said, no. Shall not kill? No. Shall not lie? No. Shall not steal? And his head went down like that. I said, so, you're a thief, are you? <laughs> so the law only makes us feel guilty if we are guilty. And this young lady showed me something was radically wrong. So I said, do you need to pray and get right with God? And she said, yeah. I said, away you go. Just tell God you're sorry for your sins. Let's pray now. And I don't remember what she prayed because my head was down, my eyes were open, and I was watching tears drip from her eyes and hit the floor like a tap dripping. See, the law shuts us up. Paul spoke of being shut up under the law and acts as a schoolmaster, gives us no hope, acts as a schoolmaster, and brings us to the foot of a blood-stained cross. Number seven, the law produces contrition. Romans 7, verse 13. Paul says that sin, by the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. That's what the law does. It produces contrition. A man was sitting in London Airport. He had bought a small tin of butter cookies. He put them at his feet and snoozed off. After some time, he was awoken to a sound of the tin lid being opened up. There's a lady beside him eating his cookies. He said, what does this woman think she's doing? Perhaps this is a local custom. So he reached in, he grabbed a cookie himself, smiled at her politely, and just went munch, munch. She took another one, so he took another one. She took another one, so he took another one. And then this woman, he couldn't believe his eyes, had the audacity to see one last cookie in his tin. She grabbed it, she broke it in half, and she offered him the other half. He thought, who does this woman think she is? The audacity, the impudence, the gall of this woman. Then he felt clunk by his foot and looked down and saw his tin of cookies was still <laughs> at his feet. Now what the world does is that it puts, he suddenly saw who the guilty one is, who the one was who had audacity, impudence, and call. But what the world does is it puts God on trial. It says, God, who do you think you are? Look at the suffering of humanity. It says, God, you're the guilty party. And when sufferings come to the world, 
It lifts its fist in rebellion to God. It judges God as being guilty. But do you know that God does not owe humanity a thing? God doesn't owe us happiness. When sufferings come our way, we cannot get angry at God. We cannot judge God guilty. The criminal cannot look at the judge and put him on trial because he's the criminal. The judge is the one who is the judge. God owes us no happiness. All God owes us is eternal justice. And what the law does is that it shows us who is eating, eating whose cookies. It shows us that we're the guilty party. We're the ones with the impudence, the audacity, the gall. It gives us light. It gives us understanding. It gives us knowledge. And without the law, we'll never convince anyone who the guilty party is. And finally, number eight, the law precedes revival. It's not finally number eight. Number eight, we're having ten points. Number eight, 2 Samuel 20, verse 3, we see that David took ten women, his concubines, and he'd have nothing to do with them because they were defiled in his eyes. Yet they had merely suffered as a result of his own sin. They could have borne him many children, but instead they remained barren. And sadly, the law is defiled in the eyes of many within the church. And it's true. Many have used the law unlawfully. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 says, But we know the law is good if it is used lawfully. And sadly, multitudes in the past have used the law seeking justification or for legalism. My bread knife is a good bread knife if I use it to slice bread. But if I take that knife and plunge it in my neighbor's back, that knife is not good. But the problem is not with a knife, it's with the hand holding the knife. And the problem isn't with God's law, it is perfect, holy, just, and good. But so many have taken that law and used it unlawfully. And as you study history, you'll see that true biblical revivals were preceded by a newfound respect for the law of God. Let's turn to Exodus 9, verse 13. Exodus 9, verse 13. And look at another function of God's law as we begin to draw to a close. Number nine. The law reveals, as I touched on earlier, the character of God. And the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve thee. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon the people. Thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence. And thou shalt be cut off from the earth. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up to show in thee my power and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. The Ten Commandments are like the Ten Plagues of Egypt. Speaking of the Ten Plagues of Egypt, I was in a Christian school recently, and 200 young people there. I says, okay, kids. The kids are about hmm, eight, nine, ten-year-olds. I said, how many of you children know the Ten Commandments off by heart, in order? I said, I've got $10 in my pocket. I'll give it to any child who can tell me the Ten Commandments in order. One can put his hand up real quick. So, okay, kid, stand up. Away you go. And this is what he said. Frogs, lice, flies. I said, thank you, sit down. That's the plagues. It's not the Ten Commandments. Anyone else? Another kid. Yes, yeah, stand up. Away you go, Ten Commandments. He said, <clears throat> running the halls, getting out of turn and light. I said, sit down. That's not the Ten Commandments. And sadly, the only children in that whole group of 200 kids that knew the Ten Commandments was my own pastor's children. You see, a number of years ago, legislation ripped the Ten Commandments off the walls of our schools, but they fell off the walls of the church. Listen to this, U.S. News and World Report. 
November the 18th, 1996. These are dark days for the Ten Commandments. It's not just that people go around breaking them all the time, nothing new there, but that so few of us seem to be able to remember these often spoken rules, what they actually say. In a 1994 survey of 1,200 people ages 15 to 35 found that most of those polled could name no more than two commandments. And as the essayist Cullen Murphy writes, they weren't too happy about some of the others when they were told about them. Surely it's time to spruce up these 3,000-year-old commandments and render them memorable and pleasing. So that's what he does. He brings some suggestions on how to spruce up these old commandments. A way out of the commandment dilemma is to keep the negative and bossy language of the original 10, but add some modifications, some loopholes, and explanatory matter. For instance, thou shalt not commit adultery, except if thou art unhappy, or if a personal fulfillment points thee towards the new secretary in thine office. You know, it's amazing that humanity think they're sprucing up the commandments, but it's already been done. There's nothing new under the sun. That's exactly what the Pharisees did. The scribes and the Pharisees looked at the commandments and thought they're too hard. Let's spruce them up a little. Honor your father and mother? Well, let's just add a little bit to that one. Shall not commit adultery? Let's just add a little bit to that one. And all Jesus did was bring a right perspective to the law. The Bible says he shall magnify the law and make it honorable. And that's all Jesus did. Sermon on the Mount. He expounded God's law and brought it to true, true perspective. And it's a reproach upon the church when the world says we only know two of the commandments. Why? Because the church is not lifting up its voice and showing this people its transgression. The way to be salt and light in a community is let the light of God's law shine, to let the salt bring that standard of righteousness into a community. The Ten Commandments like the plagues of Egypt. They plague the sinner. They turn a river of sin's pleasures into undrinkable blood. They show him that his warm and darling sins are nothing but filthy flies, devouring locusts and hideous cold-blooded frogs and loathsome lice. The law hails down the wrath of God. It plagues him with a fire of a tormented conscience. The Ten Commandments afflict him with boils, so it's painful for him to sit in the seat of the scornful. It surrounds him with a thick darkness of the shadow of death until he calls for the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God causes them to cry out, what must I do? The plagues are not pleasant, but they're utterly needful, or there'll be no applying of the blood in faith. Remember the fiery serpents that were sent among Israel? What did they do? The fiery serpents caused Israel to gaze upon the serpent, upon a pole, and Jesus likened that to the gospel of salvation. The Ten Commandments are like those ten fiery serpents. They, or those fiery serpents, they bite the sinner and cause him to flee to the cross, to him who died on Calvary's cross. So what the law does is that it causes God to be glorified in their eyes as the plagues did with Egypt and Israel. And finally, number 10, the Ten Commandments are servants of the Holy Spirit. Remember in Genesis 4, Abraham sent out his servant to find a bride for Isaac, he sent him on ten camels. And when those ten camels came to a well, the camels bowed down, and the true bride brought water and satisfied the thirst of those camels. God the Holy Spirit was sent, or God sent His Holy Spirit to find a bride for His Son. And the vehicle that the Holy Spirit uses is the law. The Holy Spirit convicts, of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Sin, which is transgression of the law, righteousness, which is by the law, and judgment. Righteousness, which is of the law, and judgment, which is by the law. And what the commandments do is they bow before the cross of Calvary, in a sense. The true convert draws water from the wells of salvation to satisfy the thirst of those Ten Commandments. Why did I need to draw water from the wells of salvation? Why did I need a Savior? because the law thirsted for eternal justice. It called for my blood. I found myself like the woman caught in the act of adultery between a rock and a hard place. The ten stones of the law were going to pound my flesh into the dirt from whence it came. That's why I needed the Savior. That's why I needed to draw water from the wells of salvation to satisfy the thirst of justice that came from God's law. 
Remember in Pilgrim's Progress, Christian said, it was he, that is the law, who did bind my heavy burden upon me. Faithful agrees and says, I, had it not been for him, we had both of us stayed in the city of destruction. Then he did us a favor, answered Christian. Faithful says, I, albeit, he did it none too gently. Isn't that well put? The law does torment us, does weigh heavy upon us. The faithful says, yeah, he did it none too gently. And Christian answers, well, at least he played the part of a schoolmaster and showed us our need. It was he who drove us to the cross. The irreversible decree of the law throws us into the den of ten devouring lions. Grace stops their mouths. The wrath of the law chases us to the edge of the Red Sea. Grace opens the waters that we may enter the promised land. Let's bow in prayer as we close today, shall we? Father, our heart grieves when we look at this world and say, Oh, horror hath consumed me because of the wicked who forsake your law. We know when a society becomes lawless, it devours itself through sin. So, Father, we pray that you'd cause us as your church to stand up boldly with the standard of righteousness as officers of the law and say, world, you need to get right with the holy God. You need to flee from the wrath that's to come. We present ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to you. We don't want to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind we may prove what is that good and perfect, acceptable will of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.